Well, good morning. How are we doing this morning? Awesome. I am so excited to be in front of you this morning. Uh, in case you're worried, I am not Pastor Stephen. <laughs> he is in Oklahoma taking some time to be with his family, so just pray for a safe trip back for him and Jay Lynn. But I am so excited to be in front of you. I'm so ready to present this word that the Lord has given me. In case we haven't had the pleasure of meeting, I am Ryan Myers. I have the privilege and honor of serving as a youth pastor here. So I love that. <laughs> love that all of our students are over there in one section. That means a lot to, to me and I'm sure everybody else. But we are in a series this morning called Keeping It Real. And I am so excited about this series Last week, Pastor Cody did an incredible job talking about spiritual warfare, and he talked about the real crisis. And oftentimes, the real the crisis we think is real is actually not the real crisis. And so, whether that's political or economic, or even in your own personal life, if you're struggling with depression, or maybe your marriage is not at the place you want, or maybe you yourself in your career is not at the place that you want to be, it's spiritual. Because there is a real enemy that hates you. There is a real enemy that wants to destroy you. Amen? He is out there, but through Jesus Christ, we have the victory. We have the ultimate victory in Jesus Christ. And so if you haven't had a chance to listen to that sermon, or even if you did, I encourage you to listen to it a second time. He gave us really good tools on how to overcome the spiritual warfare and the enemy that attacks us. Well, this morning we are continuing that series, and we're going to be talking about the real Jesus Christ. I'm so, so ready to talk about this, but before we continue, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Father, thank you, Lord. You created this moment. Father, and this moment was created for you, and I pray that right now, In this moment, your spirit moves like it never has before, that you speak directly to us, that the spirit reveals Jesus Christ, your son, to us this morning, that this morning he be made real in our lives. And I pray that I step aside and I allow you to speak, Lord, that your words flow through my mouth. I surrender myself to you and we surrender all distractions In your holy name, amen. 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 Well, when you are dating someone, oftentimes they don't reveal all of themselves to you, (laughs) right? Sometimes those little idiosyncrasies, sometimes those quirks, like they got to be slowly introduced over time. You know, it's like when your spouse burps in front of you for the first time, you're a little shocked. You have heard that noise before. But at that moment, you didn't know your spouse was capable of producing that noise. And so it's a shock because they have never done it around you before. (laughs) I'm not talking about my wife, by the way. I'm not talking about my wife. She's right here on the front row. She's amazing. Or when your husband shaves and he leaves all his little hairs all over the sink. And maybe you guys shared a sink at one point. So the husband got angry texts or calls saying, I can't even turn on the sink water because your little hairs are all over the place. (laughs) Can I just tell you, the right response is not to say, just get a towel, wipe it down, what's the big deal? That does not go over well. I may have had experience with those. (laughs) But we all have little idiosyncrasies about ourselves. And we have one of two options when it comes to our spouse. Either we just deal with those and accept they are human and they're a little weird, kind of weirdos, or we lovingly help them seek deliverance from those idiosyncrasies. (laughs) And let me tell you, there are some deliverance that I still need to go through that my wife is lovingly guiding me through. So, (laughs) but that's not the true case for Jesus. Like Jesus doesn't reveal all of who he is to us. The spirit doesn't reveal all of Jesus at one time, because if he did, that would be very overwhelming. But anytime that you read the scriptures and the spirit reveals who Jesus is, it's not, it's not a decision of, oh, I got to deal with this now or, oh, how, how am I going to process? No, it's, 
he becomes more beautiful. He becomes more majestic. He becomes more powerful. He becomes more real. And so this morning, man, I could talk about Jesus all day long, every day, until I pass away. And we will never be able to explore all of who Jesus is. But this morning, I just want to examine three things about Jesus from one passage. And if you would like to follow along, we're going to be primarily in the Gospel of John. And I love the Gospel of John. You know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Gospels or the seen-through Gospels. And they are very similar. Oftentimes, they start the same, they end the same, they include a lot of the same teachings and a lot of the same parables of Jesus, and how they explore the character of Jesus is very similar, but John takes a slightly different approach. And if you're in your Bibles, we're going to be in John 1, starting in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And I love how John starts his gospel. The other gospels, they they talk about Jesus was born from Adam or Jesus came from David. And yes, that is true. But John starts here. He comes from God. And so the first point I want to make this morning is Jesus is eternal. If you see at the very beginning, John said, in the beginning. Doesn't that sound familiar? He echoes Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so we see here John, from the very first few words, he establishes Jesus at the very beginning of creation. It's not that Jesus was a created person. It's not that Jesus, when he came to be here on the earth in his earthly ministry, that's when Jesus existed. No, he existed from the very beginning of time. So John establishes the eternal being of Jesus. But not only that, if we continue reading in John 1, verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And later on in Colossians verses, or chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Paul reiterates that thought. He says, for by him all things were created, talking about Jesus, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he, talking about Jesus, is before all things. And in him, all things consist. So see, it's not that just Jesus was at the beginning of creation. It's not that he is eternal, but he took a part in creation That God worked through Jesus. God spoke and Jesus acted in creation. Isn't that amazing to think about? That Jesus, yes, he came to earth. Yes, he, he dwelt with us, but he was there from the very beginning of time. He was active in creation. And I love what Jesus says about himself in John 8, 58, and I apologize, there's a lot of scriptures I got this morning that unfortunately they won't have behind me, but just bear with me. And Jesus said to them, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees at the time, most assuredly I say to you before Abraham was, I am. And who better to talk about Jesus than himself? He's saying before Abraham was, before anything was, I am. Am I am eternal. Jesus is eternal. And my second point this morning is Jesus is life. And we can see that by going back to John 1, verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So Jesus is life and light, and without Jesus, we are dead in our sins and we are in darkness. I love what Jesus also says in John 10, 10, and Jesus says this about himself. The thief comes not except to steal, kill, and destroy. And who is the thief? That's Satan. That's Satan. Anything to do with darkness, that is Satan. I have come. This is Jesus saying that he has come, that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. 
And so this morning, we see that Jesus, the thief, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And maybe Satan is not specifically coming after you, maybe not he himself, but have you ever chased any money? Or have you chased possessions? Have you ever chased things? Have you ever chased coping mechanisms? I don't know if that's alcohol or whatever coping mechanism that you may have in your life. Can I just be real this morning? For me, it was sexual, like my sexual sins. I, I, it, it was lust. I, anything I could do to just get a little taste of that because I didn't want to deal with the world. And it was also sleeping pills. I did not want to deal with myself at night. I didn't want to. I didn't want to think about where my life was. But can I tell you, apart from Jesus, there is no life. And I love what he says in John 11, verses 25. He says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he may die, though he may experience a physical death, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you? Believe this. And so what Jesus is saying here is that though you may die, though you may experience a physical death, though you may maybe even die to the world, die to your flesh every day, you, in me, you will have life. It's not going to look like the world. The world might tell you, hey, in order to live, you have to have X, Y, and Z. In order to live, you might have to have that nice house. In order to live, you might have to date around. In order to live, you might just have to bum around with your friends. In order to live, you might have to have fill in the blank. But what Jesus is saying here is, yeah, you die to your flesh. You die to those things that you want. But I'll give you life. And, and not just life. Not just, okay, you're going to get by. But life more abundantly. Life to the fullest. I love in Ephesians, Paul writes, we have received every spiritual blessing through Christ Jesus. And so maybe a blessing, it might not be that nice car, it might not be that new job, but you have the peace to make it through the job you're currently at. But you have the finances to make it where you need to go. You have that peace to walk into whatever situation that you have. You have the power to walk into whatever situation that Satan, dark forces, your friends might try to get you into. You have the power to walk through there and see the other side in victory. And I don't know if that's where you're at this morning. I don't know if you're struggling with, with things of the world that are just tempting you. I don't know if you're struggling with your coping mechanisms. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if you're discontent of where you're at. But can I tell you my third and final point is Jesus is the Savior. He's the Savior. I love in John 1 verse 5, it says, And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And yes, the darkness didn't understand the light because light has no business being with darkness. Amen? There's no mixing of dark and light. Light shines out darkness. But other translations say, did not overcome it. The darkness cannot overcome the light. And so that victory, and this is amazing, that victory was foretold in Genesis 3.15. This is God, the Father, talking to the Satan, who is the serpent at this point. He says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her, notice the capital S, seed, he shall bruise, some translations say crush, and I like that better, he shall crush your head, and you will bruise his heel. Who is this talking about? Well, if you remember all the way at the beginning of creation, Adam and Eve, they ate of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil. The one tree, the one fruit that God had said, hey, you can eat anything else but this one. They disobeyed. They sinned. But if you notice, God cursed the serpent. 
He did not curse Adam and Eve. As a matter of fact, he said, I'm going to send somebody to crush your head. Yeah, you might bruise his heel. Yeah, he's going to die. Yeah, he'll be, he'll be whipped. Yeah, he'll be crucified. But in the end, he will crush your head. So the destiny of Satan was already written in stone from the very beginning. And if we go back to John 1.1, 1, 1, gosh, I love this. He says, in the beginning was the word. And it's so interesting that John uses word to describe Jesus. I, I don't know about you, but I've oftentimes wondered why. Why do you use word? Why didn't he just say Jesus? Why didn't he just say the Lamb of God? Why didn't he just say the Son of God? He could have used anything. He could have said Jesus himself, but instead he uses word. Well, at the time that John is writing this, the Jewish leaders at the time, word was very significant. They only used the word word to describe the word of God. And for them, the word was God's action. When God said something, it had to happen. And that's what they believed. And that's what we believe, amen? When God says something, it has to happen. And so there's this intimate relationship between the word and God's actions. Like God doesn't speak anything in void. There's nothing void about what God says. And so when he said this, 315, Genesis 315, and all throughout scriptures, if you read Isaiah, there is a promised savior, there is a promised seed. That is the word of God. And so what John is saying here is that now the word has become flesh. Now the word is here. That promised savior that you wanted, that promised savior that you've been looking for, stop looking. He's here. Believe in him and you will have eternal life. And we see that in John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And that word dwelt there is the same word that they can use for tent or tabernacle. I don't know if you remember when the Israelites were in the wilderness, they set up a tent and they called it the tent of meeting. And that's where the fullness of the glory of God dwelt. And so we see here in Jesus when the word, the words that God had spoken, when they became flesh, it wasn't that just Jesus appeared in physical form. It wasn't that he just came down and looked like a man. No, he was a man. When Jesus was hungry, he was hungry. When he was whipped and executed, he felt that pain. That was real for him. And so when he says dwelt, the fullness of the glory of God was inside Jesus Christ, the person who is full of grace and who is full of truth. So those coping mechanisms that we talked about, I don't know if it might be depression that you're dealing with, just turn to Jesus. If you want to experience grace, it's there. If you want to experience God, he's there. If you want to experience mercy, Jesus is there. And he humbled himself to dwell among us. In Philippians 2, 7 through 8, it says, but made himself, this is talking about Jesus, of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus is eternal. He was with the Father. He was there at creation. He was God's agent in creation. And he came to step down and in obedience and at the Garden of Gethsemane, if you guys remember that story, Jesus was a man, and he was so stressed. He asked the Father, please, if it be your will, take this cup from me that it may pass. 
but I surrender to your will, Father. I surrender your will. And so he did that for you. He did that for me. And I just want to tell you that salvation is not a, it's a one-time thing. And if you haven't experienced him, in a moment, I'll call our altar team up to the front and we would love to pray with you. But Jesus also gives you freedom. So yeah, maybe you have been saved, but there are still some battles. Can I tell you that he has had the ultimate victory? He has had the ultimate victory. And I want to close this morning with a passage, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Cherry, go ahead and come up. And unfortunately, they don't have this, but just bear with me. This is in the book of Ephesians. This is Paul writing. He says, And you were dead in the transpassions and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. We were counted among the rest of mankind. But God, but God, I love that Paul interrupts the narrative here saying, hey, you were once passions and slaves to your flesh. You were once driven by darkness. You were once, that's where, where the darkness was, that's where you wanted to be. And there was no hope but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead, even when we were dead, and can I tell you, dead men don't know that they're dead. Dead people don't know that they're dead. Dead people do not know that they're dead. We did not know that we were dead. Made us alive together with Christ. Made us alive together with Christ. And it's by grace that you have been saved and raised us up with him, with Jesus, seated us with Jesus in the heavenly places in Christ so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's grace that the Lord stuck out his hands. It's grace that the Lord sent his son but now it's by faith, you need to take hold of that. Now it's by faith. Hey, you see Jesus, you know about Jesus, but by in faith, take the gift of salvation. Do it this morning, don't wait. Don't wait, if you haven't yet, don't wait. If you need to experience Christ afresh and anew, can I tell you that his mercies are new each and every morning? Each and every morning. So if you need to experience Jesus afresh and anew in your life, it doesn't matter where he is because he is the Lord of all. He is eternal, so he knows everything. Everything was made through him. He was before all things, so he sits on the throne. There's nothing that Jesus can't do. There's nothing that Jesus is not the Lord of. It's just whether or not you want to surrender it to him. I love Jesus also says, my burden is easy. My yoke is light. Come to me all who are weary and want rest. Are you tired this morning? Are you tired of fighting your own battles this morning? Come to Jesus. He can give you that rest. Come to Jesus. He can remind you of the victory. Speak his name. You know, the amazing thing about Jesus is he transcends the darkness. So if you've been surrounded by darkness for, I don't know, years, the last few months, maybe, 
maybe a year ago, you were a totally different person and you were on fire for Jesus. You were, you were rocking it. You were waking up every day. But now, life kind of just happened. You got busy. You stopped reading like you did. You stopped sharing like you did. You stopped serving like you did. But can I tell you, you speak the name of Jesus and light is shown. You run back to Jesus. I love the parable of the prodigal son. It says, while he was still afar off, while the son was still afar off, the son went his own way. The son was already with the father. The son already had the blessings of the father, but he went his own way. And while he was still afar off, the father ran towards his son. While he was still afar off, he didn't even give his son a chance to say, I'm sorry. He didn't, he didn't wait for his son to come to him fully. I don't know who needs to hear this this morning, but God is not waiting for you to fully come to yourself. God is not waiting for you to get clean. God is not waiting for you to just wake up and realize, okay, now I got to dust myself off. I got to get better and then I can go back to the Father. No, he wants you now. He wants you now. So can I tell you, God has had his welcome home speech for way longer than you've ever started preparing for a please take me back speech. He has that ready. He wants that for you. I want to go ahead and invite our prayer team forward. And this morning, I don't, I don't know if you have never experienced Jesus Christ before. But if you haven't, please come forward. Please accept prayer. We want to pray with you. Or maybe you have before and you were on fire at one point, but now the world has gotten in the way. You've gotten distracted. The enemy overloaded you with a fight. The enemy came in and you listened to the enemy. You don't have to listen to the enemy anymore. Because Jesus has given you the ultimate victory. So this morning, just go ahead and bow your heads. And if anybody needs prayer right now, I want to give you a chance to respond. If anybody needs prayer for whatever it is, please go ahead and come forward. Like, don't wait. We are here. Jesus is here. Jesus is wanting to meet you right here, right now, where you're at. But if you don't come forward, that's okay. Jesus is not limited to the altars. Jesus is not limited to the altars. Jesus can meet you right where you're at. Or maybe when you go home, Jesus is where you live. God, we thank you. God, we thank you that you so love the world that you gave your only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life for you do not condemn us father but you want us to experience that freedom lord that freedom that comes through your son jesus christ who is before all things and who is above all things god i thank you for the word that you spoke at the very beginning of creation saying that your son would crush the enemy's head. And I thank you for that victory. And I proclaim boldness in this moment in Jesus' name that whoever needs to come forward, whoever needs to surrender their life to Jesus, Lord, I pray that they do it now because your son gives us life and life more abundantly a life that is worth living that we were dead and we didn't know we were dead but even though we were dead you give us life Jesus I thank you for your obedience Lord I thank you that you are life I thank you that you are the Savior that you humbled yourself to obedience, even to death on the cross. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And in this moment, with your head still bowed, I just ask the Holy Spirit what he's saying to you. Or speak Jesus into your life in this moment. Like, ask the Spirit to bring in remembrance if you have forgotten things that you're holding on to, coping mechanisms that you have, darkness that you've allowed to creep back in. Just ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate those and then speak the name of Jesus about those. just pass you by because the spirit is here Jesus is here the Lord is here the fullness of grace and peace is here don't let this moment pass by Yo 
Sing your own song to him. Sing your own song to him. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Jesus, King Jesus, King Jesus. You are King Jesus. You are giver of life, Jesus. grace and mercy is unsearchable. His love is unfathomable. And we just thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We offer our praise. We offer our worship. We offer our adoration because you deserve it. You are worthy of it all, Lord. You are so worthy. You are so worthy. Even though we were dead, you made us alive in Christ. You are so worthy. And all we have to offer you is our praise. The breath that is in our lungs, is, it's not even our breath. It's borrowed from you and we return it back to you. Thank you. further prayer, please don't leave here the same way that you came in, because there is real victory that you can experience through Jesus Christ. If you'll stick out your hands in front of you, I'm going to give you something. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you, and may the Lord give you peace. I bless you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed week, church. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. We pray that you have been blessed by God's word. For more information, visit us online at heightslife.org.